Hello, today we're going to discuss projectile motion. Projectile motion is also referred to as two-dimensional motion. Galileo called it compound motion because it is the combination or the compound of a horizontal constant motion and a vertical accelerated motion. Okay, the horizontal motion is constant because there is nothing there acting upon it. In the vertical direction though, gravity is present. And so when we do these kind of problems and we're looking at this, we want to treat these two things as being separate. Okay? The horizontal and vertical velocities are independent of one another. Okay, that's something very important to remember. That they are independent of one another. Okay? Meaning they do not affect each other. An object's vertical component compared to its horizontal component, they make no difference on each other. Okay, if an object is fired horizontally from a certain height and dropped from the same height, they'll hit the ground at the same time. X and Y quantities, because they are independent of each other, must be kept separate when we do problems. Okay, so in our problem solving, we have to keep those two things separate. Okay, so compound motion, two-dimensional motion, projectile motion, all the same thing. And they deal with an object that's traveling both horizontally at a constant rate and at the same time vertically while its motion is being accelerated. Okay? Because we have to keep these things separate, we need to talk about how we separate these two-dimensional vectors from each other. Okay? So this is an example of a two-dimensional vector in that it has both horizontal and vertical components. Okay? It's going both to left and right and up and down. So we're going to separate this out into two one-dimensional vectors that line as horizontal as I can. Okay, so it has a vertical component. Well, the first there is a horizontal component and it has this vertical component. Okay. So if we look at this, we have the horizontal component, which is the blue line, and we have the vertical component, which is the green line. Okay, basically, you're just going to be completing this triangle, making a right triangle out of it. And the reason we have to do that is that velocity is an example of a vector quantity. So any vector quantity that you have that you need to separate out into components, you're going to have to set up in a triangle and complete the triangle. Okay, so if we were to label this triangle, we have our angle theta right here. This is a right angle. Okay, and the examples we're going to look at, our two-dimensional value will be some velocity, which will be along our hypotenuse. Okay, because that is the two dimensions that, or that represents the two-dimensional motion here. We would have a horizontal component of the velocity, Vx, and we would have the vertical component of the velocity, Vy. If it is an object that's being fired from some point in the, about the original or the initial velocity, we would have call this then the v not y. Okay, but the Vx is always Vx because our x velocity is always constant. Okay, so we set this up and we want to determine what Vy is and what Vx is in terms of V and theta. All right. So if we look at theta, we know that Vy is the opposite side from theta and V is our hypotenuse. And so our trig identity that relates the opposite and the hypotenuse is the sine. So if we look at this and we find the sine of theta, that would equal Vy over V. So if we then solve for Vy, we get that Vy is V times the sine of theta. Okay, so just a real simple trig identity there, plugging in our, our angle as theta, plugging in our velocity as V is V, and then we're solving for our velocity in the Y direction. We can do the same thing then for our X side because it's the adjacent side to our angle theta. And so our trig identity that relates the adjacent and the hypotenuse is cosine. So if we were to set this up, we would say the cosine of theta equals Vx over V. And if we rearrange that, we get that Vx, the horizontal component of motion, is equal to the overall speed times the cosine of the angle theta. And remember, that is going to be a constant value because there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction when we're ignoring air resistance, which is what we're going to be doing. If you were to look at the motion of an object in terms of a projectile, we can determine some different things about its motion by looking at these vectors here. Okay, so we'll call this our overall V. This will be our Vx. 
and then we'll have the VY as well. Okay. As the object travels up in the air, its VX is going to stay relatively constant. Okay, it will stay actually all the way constant if we're talking about air resistance being ignored. Okay, our VY though is going to get smaller and smaller. Why? Good, because gravity is affecting it. Okay, and at the peak, what is it doing in the vertical direction? That's right, at the peak here, it's changing direction. And we know that in order to change direction, you must have one moment in that change where your velocity is zero. But is the velocity in both directions going to be zero at the peak? Of course not. Okay, if it was zero at the peak, the ball would get to the point and just levitate it here and hang in the air. And if you're watching a baseball game or a football game, you know, the ball going out of the outfield or the quarterback throwing a pass, the ball would hang up in the air and just stay there for as long as it chose to. But no, it is just vertical or just uh, at rest in the vertical direction. Okay, so we're going to continue and complete our little graph here. And you'll notice that on the way down, the VYs are getting larger while our VX is remaining the same. Okay, the VX is constant, VY is accelerated. And so as we can see that, object flies through and we get these smaller and smaller vertical vectors as it goes up and hopefully as well as I drew it, constant horizontal vectors. Okay, we call the distance it goes horizontally the delta x, sometimes that's referred to as the range. Okay, and then if we're talking about the peak height, you know, this would be our delta y at the peak, okay, to get to the peak height right there. Okay, so that's how we will look at it graphically. So let's solve a problem real quick. So in this case, we have a ball being fired with an initial velocity of 100 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. What is the range of the ball's flight? Okay, so we set this up. First thing we're going to do is we're going to draw a velocity vector. All right, so let's make this as official as we can. And we're gonna draw a little vector right here. Okay, and that's going to represent our overall speed, which in this case is that 100 meters per second. Our angle here is 30 degrees. And so we're going to determine what our Vx and because this is our initial condition for our flight, this will be our V naught Y, our initial velocity in the Y direction. So we're going to solve for Vx and V naught Y using our trig identities. And like we did before, we said that Vx is equal to V times the cosine of theta. So we'll plug in, it'll be 100 meters per second times the cosine of 30. And let me plug that in my calculator right quick and you'll get that the speed is 86 points, sorry about that, 6 meters per second in the x direction, okay? V naught y is going to be V times the sine of theta, so that's going to be 100 meters per second times the sine of 30 which is gonna be 50 meters per second. Sorry, it's so cramped together there. So now we have our Vx and we have our V naught Y. Earlier I said that we need to keep our X and Y components separate. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use something called an XY table. And you've probably seen something like this called a T table when you first start doing algebra and graphing. This isn't really a T table because we're not pairing up values on each side of the table, but we are gonna be keeping our values separate in this table. The first thing we're gonna put is our Vx because that's our first given in our V naught Y. If you wanted to do your V times cosine 30 here and V times sine 30 here, that's fine. You don't have to do it over here on the side if you want. choose not to. So we're going to plug in. We've already plugged in. And we're going to put in our values. Okay. The question is asking what is the range of light? Okay. So what are we solving for here? We are going to be solving for Horizontal displacement, delta x, that's our question mark. Okay? And we assume it's going to come back down and hit the ground. It doesn't tell us that it's not going to come back to the ground. It doesn't tell us some height to measure to or doesn't want us to find delta y. So I'm assuming it's going to come back down to the ground. If it comes back down to the ground, what is this delta y? Exactly, it's going to be zero meters. Okay, because it's going to go up and come back down to the ground again. We know that this is in the 
vertical direction, so our acceleration is going to be gravity. Let's just use 10 right now, just to keep it a little bit easier. If this is up and this is down, our velocity is up and our acceleration is down, we know that our acceleration must have the opposite sign, so it's got to be negative 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so here's us, our givens right at this point, and we need to find delta x. Remember that our acceleration or our motion on the x side is going to be constant. We only know one equation for constant velocity, and that's that vx equals delta x over t. Okay? And if we notice, we have vx, 86.6 meters per second. We're trying to solve for delta x. And so what else do we need? We need the time. Okay, and how are we going to find the time? Well, we're going to solve for that over here on our y side. So our unknown now for our y becomes the time of flight. Okay? So we're going to slide this up and over real quick. Hopefully we have the problem written down just so we have a little more room to work. And we're going to solve for the time. So our equation that involves these four variables is that delta y equals v naught y t plus one half a t squared. And you can make the a a g if you wanted to because we're looking at gravity. So zero equals 50 meters per second times t plus one half negative five or negative 10 meters per second squared times t squared. So I'm going to solve for t. I'm going to bring my 50 over. So I'm going to get negative 50 meters per second. t equals negative 5 meters per second squared times t squared. One of our t's will cancel out. And we'll get that the time in flight in the air is going to be good, 10 seconds. Okay, it's going to be in the air for 10 seconds. So now I can take this time and I can use it over here on the other side of the equation, okay? Because remember, an object cannot be in the air longer horizontally than it is vertically and vice versa. Okay, it's time of flight is it's time of flight. That is the only thing we're going to allow to cross this membrane, okay? In biology, you probably learned about semi-permeable membranes. Well, if we treat this as a semi-permeable membrane, where the only thing that can permeate it is the time. Okay, so now we're gonna plug that in over here on this side. Our Vx is 86.6 meters per second. Our delta x is what we're solving for, and our time is 10 seconds. So we cross multiply, and we get that delta x is 866 meters. Okay, so that's a long way for a ball to go. Probably not a very realistic speed there for a ball, but hopefully you get the gist there and get the idea of separating your variables, making sure that if you have a two-dimensional velocity vector, that you definitely break it apart. And then what did we do with the 100 once we broke it apart? Exactly, nothing. We never used it again. And that's the key here, guys. Once you use this two-dimensional velocity, you never use it again. Okay? Keep your variables separated. Keep them independent of each other, except for the time. And you'll be a pretty good problem solver in two-dimensional problems. Thanks.